ladies and gentlemen, this is Trisha with Insectopia, and recently I have been out and about collecting all types of insects. I've been blacklighting a lot, I've been taking a lot of hikes, um, trying to get my collection up because we've been sketching a lot of insects and I want to make sure that we keep our collection and our ability to check out insects under the microscope really diverse. Um, so, surprise, I'm going to be pinning insects, and I figured if I was going to be pinning and sitting at my desk anyway, I might as well turn on my turn on a couple of cameras and some lights and um, do it with you guys. So, I have a variety of moths that I did collect that I plan on spreading, including an underwing moth that's really exciting because the, the hind wings of the moth are bright yellow. Um... I also saw that night a, um, a false underwing moth, but I don't remember, I honestly, I don't remember if I collected it, so it might be a surprise to me, um, whether or not I collected it. So, let's see, I'm gonna get this and that. I have a couple things to grab really quick. My paper. Ugh. There we go. So I use, <clears throat> uh, I'll be going through the, um, I'll be going through like the materials that I'm using as I'm using them. So um, one of the things that I really like for insect collecting, insect collections are the micron pens. These are, um, these are archival, these are pens with archival ink in them. So when you use micron pens, you actually can put whatever you write directly into alcohol because the alcohol won't um, make micron pens um, leak or spread, you know, because most ink, when you put it into alcohol, it's going to end up kind of getting blurry and then it goes away completely and then you have lost all of your data. Um, whereas these micron pens work significantly better. So I'm going back and looking at some pictures to make sure that I put the right date on everybody. Let's see. Info. There's the info button. June 13th. And we were at Brendan T. Burn. All right, so when I am making labels just to stick next to, just to sit next to the insects, I'll go ahead and just put the date and the location. And then when I do go back and finalize labels, I make sure that the locality label also has as close to GPS coordinates as I can get with um, plus or minus and then um, making sure that your locality labels also have your name on them and any more specific information that you can think of yourself. All right. Let's pull some friends out. So these moths should still be pretty moist from um, being collected. So we shouldn't have any, we shouldn't have any problems with What type of software do I use um, when I am to show myself and the things I'm working with? Yeah, so right now I use a program, um, a freeware program called OBS. It's Open Broadcast Source or Open Broadcast System and it allows me to create what they call a virtual camera. And that camera goes, can um, directly live stream to YouTube. Um, so that's what I use. Now, um, I also have two cameras. I have a USB Aboco camera um, that is looking down at my desk. Ooh. 
So that's our carpenter worm moth that we're going to be spreading today. That's going to be our first um, our first run that we're spreading. Um, the other thing, the other camera that I use is this camera up front that's facing me. That's actually my phone camera. Um, I use a Droid app called Air. I use a Droid app called Air Droid, and. Um, so what that allows me to do is it allows me to look at my phone camera through my computer and I can put that image onto OBS and kind of mix it all together. Um, hi Chaos! Welcome back to our, you know, surprise, hey let's pin some bugs together session. So Kate, that's uh, what I do for, that's what I do for my cameras. All right, so there are a couple of different pins that we're going to be working with today. The first one is the one that we actually are going to be leaving in the specimen, right? That's the one that goes through its body. I like to use size 2 pens, um, size 2 pins. Now, um, insect pins range in sizes from triple zero all the way up to size 7, I believe. But size 7 are really, really long pins. Um, really the tallest, the highest number you should go up to is like 3. Um, I generally use size 2 pins inside of my insect body unless they are significantly smaller than that. And then I will go ahead and use a thinner pin. Now, um... With moths and butterflies, we are going to be spreading her wings open, and we're going to be making sure that, well, I'll show you the line in a minute, um, but we're going to be spreading her wings open, and whenever we are spreading an insect fully, we want to make sure that the pin goes through the center of the body. So if I was going to go ahead and put this red dot where the pin is supposed to go, the pin is trying to go right here in the very, very center of the thorax. The, that's a little off to the right. Right about there. You're welcome. I hope it's helpful. All right. So... To make sure that our pin um, went through the specimen properly, right, a lot of times we'll do kind of a little twist test where you can spin your specimen around, and it's kind of hard to do underneath the camera. There we go. But we spin our specimen around, and we just make sure that it's even in all angles. And so my moth is, and it has a huge body. So I'm actually going to be switching to a pinning board that has a wider channel in it. These are all home all homemade pinning boards as you can as you can see. All right. All right, so we have our moth centered in this pinning board and oh, the other pinning board had my pins. I've grabbed two zero pins. All right, these are these are very very thin pins. They're almost like springy, right? And what I'm gonna be doing with these is you're gonna grab the upper part of the wing and you're gonna open up these. Um, you're gonna open up the moth's wings. Now, um, give me a minute. I think I should give you guys the name of what we're working with. So. Now you know what we're working with. Okay. So the strongest vein in a moth's wing is actually going to be the first vein. We call it the coastal vein. And you're grabbing, um, you're grabbing the strongest vein and you're going to pull it all the way up. Now, let's see. It's been a minute since I have done this under camera, so... Give me a moment while we... Actually, we're going to have to... 
our body is spinning a little bit. So did you see when I grabbed him or him or her? Um, the body spun a little bit. So what I want to do is I want to bring it back to center and I'm going to be putting a pin kind of in between his wing and his body and holding him this way and then in the other direction, holding him that way. So now I've got these pins kind of crossed and they are holding his body so that when I pull the wing, it's not going to spin. Come on, friend. All right. I have misplaced my butterfly forceps, which is what I would normally use at this point. Um, but I have um, flat, rounded forceps, so I might be able to use them to get this wing up a little bit more. It's being just a little bit of a butt head. There we go. We got it. All right. So our goal is to make sure that the body is straight is a, and then this angle right here, the bottom side of the front wing, we want it to make a 90 degree angle with the body. And so we want it to kind of line up in this direction. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and I discovered when I was doing the last one that the vein is a little bit further back than I'm used to on this moth. So there we go. Um, our goal is to get them all the way out like that. Now I have, this is the butterfly envelope that I collected my moth into. Sometimes you can use this. Oh, what is it made out of? Um, it's a material that's very, very similar to wax paper. In fact, you can use wax paper for this step if you don't have butterfly envelopes. And your goal, your goal is to get enough of this paper so that it covers kind of the end of the wing all the way up to where your pin is. Um, and then we're going to put pins all the way around it so that the wing is held flat. Now, we use these papers um, because butterflies and moths have scales on their wings, right? And if we touch them, those scales are going to get rubbed off and they can get injured and damaged and all of the other things. But if we go ahead and use this paper, then the scales don't get damaged in the process. All right, so that's one wing down, and we're going to be going all the way around. I want to grab this hind wing really quick. Dry sockets suck. Oh, no. Well, I'm glad you're feeling a lot better, Chaos. So I learned a little bit about carpenter moths. That was kind of fun. Um, well, did you know? So carpenter moths, as caterpillars, instead of feeding on... Instead of feeding on leaves and plant material, like most caterpillars, carpenter moths actually uh, feed on wood. Um, they feed under the bark. So there's a whole caterpillar that is wood boring and that's these guys' caterpillars. Now I found a, um, I found a, a Lepidopteran pupil cell that looked pretty large. I think that it definitely could have been one of these guys. Um, and then that same night I collected two of these carpenter worm moths. There's this one, and the other one's right there that I have to move. All right, so we've got two wings taken care of. Now we just have to get this other wing up. Um, in the hind wings, you don't have a coastal vein like you do on the front wing, so you don't have one vein that's going to be so strong that you can kind of pull up, but there is something that we call 
I think it's called the D cell. Anyway, there's a cell on the hind wing, and it's right about here. It's right about here. And that's where there's this little cell area in my hind wing that if I put my pin in it, there's enough strength to pull the wing up to where it should be. And now I can put this paper on both the front and the hind wing because they are all set. is pretty even. I think we are pretty good. Moving on to our next specimen. So, ooh. If I look at the abdomen of my carpenter worm moth, um, now that I'm looking at it, its abdomen is going to be so heavy that it's going to fall in the process. So, I'm going to make sure that it stays up a little bit by instead of having the cross, don't mind that, pins and styrofoam sound. Instead of having the cross underneath the body, holding the body down, I'm going to go ahead and put an X of pins underneath the body to hold the body up so that as it's drying, um, it's going to stay at the right angle. Now, the other thing that I could fix are these antenna. Um, if we want to keep the antenna kind of in the same angle, that looks about right. The left one just had to come up a little bit. All right, so that's for finishing touches on my carpenter worm moth. I actually have one more carpenter worm moth, so we might as well go ahead and pin that one too. Um, now, they have a sexual, they are sexually dimorphic, so the males and the females look significantly different, although I'm not sure. If I saw a male, I don't believe that I did. So I don't think I saw a male when I was out collecting. I just saw go into my special bag of um, pins and get a number two pin that is going to be going into the body of my carpenter worm moth. And it's going centrally located, right? So right here in between the wings. other goal is to make sure that, right, we give it the spin test, make sure it's going to stay even in all directions. Looks like it's good. And then, um, we can go ahead and put it in here. Let's see. Oh, we also want to make sure that it's pretty high up on the pin because you want enough space on the bottom of the pin to have a locality label and an identification label and still have enough of the pin left to put it in the board, right? So there's a lot of things that have to happen on that pin. Um, so getting your specimen up close to the top of the pin is going to be important. Um, in my experience... The, um, the little wooden pinning blocks that people... Alright, I've got to get... <clears throat> got to get her body stabilized first. So like I said before, I always get a, I put a cross of pins right here around their body just to make sure that when I try and grab the wing, she doesn't spin her body up. And then I'm going to go ahead, grab right there underneath the coastal vein. Oh. All right. Looks like she needs to go just a little bit higher. I 
looks better. So we have the front wing and the hind wing all taken care of. I'm going to go ahead and grab some of my butterfly envelope, cut myself a little slice off of it, and go ahead take these two pins out because they're the little ones that I use to grab wings and put some thicker pins around the edges. do my left side first because I am left-handed so if I have the left side done getting to the right sides a little easier but if I have the right side done sometimes getting around all of those pins is a little bit more frustrating Let's see if I can go ahead and grab this hind wing and pull it up a little bit. Maybe a little higher. Does that look better? I think that that's pretty even. I need to give myself an X that I put on the screen just so that I can make sure. I think that that would actually be pretty helpful. Um, but I'm thinking that that looks pretty even to me, so I'm going to go ahead and cut myself another piece off of this envelope. Um, a lot of times I will reuse my envelopes um, to collect even more moths or butterflies, um, but I'll go ahead and cut up maybe one of the envelopes that's a little dirtier that I don't really plan on using again, and I'll make it into butterfly slips. Um, sometimes these guys get reused if I, um, if I think that they're big enough and they're, you know, worth holding on to, essentially. Let's see. Alright. Out, out. So I know this isn't kind of my normal content. Normally I'm going about, um, normally I'm going about sketching and so people can sketch along with me. Uh, but today I really needed to get my, I really needed to get some of my collection pinned up. So I'm excited to just get, get here and take care of this with you guys. Alright, now I'm going to make sure that that X is not on the top of the abdomen, but on the bottom side of the abdomen, because these are chonky moths. These ladies have ginormous abdomens, and I want to make sure that there's some nice support underneath them holding them up. Oh no, is my right side a little higher than my left side? It slipped! I'm going to fix this really quick. Let's see. How did it slip so far?
sometimes it's a little easier for me to look at a specimen head on. So right about now, I am pulling one of my moth wings because it looks like it just, it, it, it changed its, its, um, it dropped just a little bit after I left. And I want to make sure that it's going to hold the right position because if it slips just a little bit when I'm moving the board, the likelihood is that when it dries, it's going to be, it's going to change its position a lot more. So I want to make sure that it's going to stay in place. Now we are about to move off of the carpenter moths and check out some other species. There we go. That's better. Now we're getting somewhere. All right, so we got that carpenter worm moth taken care of. That makes me happy. Um, we have one more, looks like one more moth to spread. Oh, I believe this is our under, our yellow underwing moth. I believe it's in the genus Noctua. N-O-C-T-U-A. Uh, it actually, the, the moth bag that it was, the moth envelope that it was in is pretty good, so I'm going to be able to reuse it. Yay! Alright, so our specimen looks like this from the top. So she's got this very beautiful kind of wooden-like camouflage on its hot, hot, top four wings. And then the hind wings are going to be yellow and beautiful. What would I do to pin big moths, like atlas moths? Um, I would do pretty much the same procedure, except that the larger the moths, um, the larger these papers have to be, but also if I'm doing a really, really big moth, I'll take a long strip of wax paper and I will put it at the base of the wing and then about an inch or two out and I'll use a longer sheet to hold kind of two thinner pieces down. Um, that's going to help because the wings are so heavy, they want to fall back a lot. Um, so if you give those extra two pieces, there's a little bit more stability. And then you put a big piece over the whole wing. Um, wherever you are seeing where there's like wax paper on top of the wings, um, those areas of the wings are going to be nice and flat. Um, whereas if you have, if you don't, if you just have a couple of strips, maybe a strip at the end and a strip at the beginning, and you don't kind of cover the wing in wax paper, your wings are going to be a little bit more wavy when they come down. When they dry, they won't dry all the way flat. So that's what I would suggest, is making sure you've got lots of wax paper or um, butterfly envelopes to cut up. All right, let me go grab my number two pin for my underwing's body. Oh, I didn't go ahead and fix the antenna on this um, right on this moth, so I'm just gonna go grab a grab a different pin. Let's see. I'm gonna come up here and just make sure that my antenna are positioned properly. And if it looks like they're going to drag a little bit or it looks like they might move if I move the board, I'll just go ahead and put a pin in the direction I think that they might move, um, just so that they stay even enough. All right, let's check out my underwing. So like I mentioned, when we are pinning moths that we are going to spread, 
Our goal is to put the pin directly through the center of the thorax. Um, but if, all right, and then we give it the spin test and you make sure that um, it is even on every angle, right? You wanna make sure that it's not angled one way or another. So I think we did pretty good with this one. And then we wanna make sure it's pretty high up there on the pin, so might scoot it up just a, uh, let's see. That's about where I, where I would put my moth on my pin. And then squoosh it down, swoosh it down into the board down here. Now this, is, this spreading board is actually kind of large for this yellow underwing moth. Um, you can see that the entire, all of the wings and everything fit into the channel. Um, I would probably have used, uh, the other board for this one, but I like to keep them all together. So this is how it's going to be. I'm going to, I don't know if I'm going to be able to stabilize the, um, the body on this one. I don't know if I'll be able to get, yeah, I will get a pin. Um, because the four wings are overlapping on my underwing, so I have to try and get, there we go, get that pin kind of underneath the wing, underneath the right wing, but above the left wing, and hopefully that will hold my moth's body so that it doesn't spin when I do this. Look at how beautiful that underwing is. Do you have more specific questions, Chaos, about spreading big moths like Atlas moths? Um, I have spreaded large moths like Imperial moths and um, Isle moths and Luna moths, um, all of those types. I would say that if you're having a hard time um, moving the wings, um, you really want butterfly forceps. They make your life a lot easier. Um, I, my butterfly forceps are MIA at the very moment. Um, so I am, I'm just using pins, but if I had butterfly forceps, I could actually just grab the wing and pull it up to where it was supposed to be. Alright, so that is about where I'm going to want my wings. Maybe this front wing we want even a little bit higher. Yeah. I'm liking that a lot. So we're going to go ahead and put a strip on it. And I'm going to make sure that I line these wings because I don't want any slippage. It's kind of frustrating to have to redo any work that you've already done, right? So once we have it looking nice, we want to make sure that we put a bunch of pins surrounding all the way around. Make sure that this wing isn't going to slip because I don't leave the pins that are actually in the wings of the moth. Um, I will take those two out, um, especially because I don't want something to bump those pins and then damage the wings. Um, they're also really, really fine pins. They're double zero pins. So I like to keep them separate. I don't like to get them mixed up with all of my other pins. Is pinning myriapods, especially millipedes? Yeah, see, I haven't pinned my, very many myriapods um, because with millipedes, a lot of times in collections, you're not supposed to pin them. Um, 
For scientific collections, millipedes stay in alcohol. All right, I'm going to be using forceps for this one. It didn't give... There we go. So you can see how my body is tilted over there towards the right, and we don't want that. Um, I also have this wing that's halfway out. So what I'm going to worry about is I'm going to grab and pull this. Oh, it's got to go. Got to go under. You got to go under the front wing, babe. Silly hind wing wants to go up on top of it. Well, I'll fix that in a minute. All right, so look at me. I'm making it sideways. Ha. Huh. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and straighten out this body by just going and grabbing right about in here, pulling it straight, and then putting, there we go, and then putting an X underneath that abdomen to make sure that it stays up. All right, so now all I have to do is get this front wing up to where it should be now and make sure that it goes on top of that hind wing, that pesky hind wing that's trying to, all it can to be on top. There we go. So when you pin um, when you pin millipedes, what is your problem with like with pinning them? Do they not come out? There we go. Um, do the do the millipedes not come out properly? Do they not dry out? Do they kind of shrink a little bit? Less access to alcohol. Got it. Um, yeah, that's the arachnids and... So, do you guys collect caterpillars also? And how do you, how do you go about, um, how, how do you go about keeping those? Would be my question. Um... Glassine. These are called glassine envelopes. Um, it took me a minute, but I did finally get there. <laughs> so I don't know how many of you, um, I don't know if Chaos, if you're a fan of Instagram, but recently, I have been, when I go out on hikes or go out and taking pictures, I've been um, posting pictures on my Instagram story, and that has been a good amount of fun for me. So, if any of you out there like to follow Instagram stories, you can go and check out my, um, I'm, my tag is at Insectopia2015 on Instagram. All right, that's the zero pin, and this is the zero pin. No. The zero pins are in the wings. So we have an underwing taken care of. <clears throat> now, I think a lot of the, I 
think that many of the rest of the specimens that I have are beetles and not moths. Yeah. Let's do some beetles. So I want to get my container all closed up. And what I'm doing is going ahead and switching surfaces. Um, these are on my spreading board, uh, whereas I'm going to be putting beetles just on some on styrofoam so that uh, the beetles don't really need this channel for an area to spread their wings. I'm going to be putting this aside somewhere, aside where the cats can't get it. All right. And this is going to be the board that I use to pin the beetles. Let's see. It looks like we're going to be doing some scarab beetles. We've got a variety of different types, so I'm just going to go scarab beetles. Odinates are your specialty, and butterflies and moths are your friends. Very cool. Um, I just wonder because uh, without the without access to alcohol, um, I wonder how you are killing your specimens because you probably don't have access to CAD, which is what I use to drop. You drop a caterpillar or immature insects that are soft bodied into CAD first, um, and so this is an in, this is a, a liquid that kills the specimen, but also um, makes it so that when it dies, it doesn't kind of shrivel up. Where, um, but like if you put a caterpillar direct in, directly into alcohol, it kind of shrivels up. But a lot of times, if you let a caterpillar just die, it's going to shrivel up, too. You kind of need, a, like, a, a process. Um, so, I've heard of people... I've heard of people... Um... Boiling caterpillars... I've heard of people boiling caterpillars so that they stayed plump, but I thought that they still had to be put in al into alcohol afterwards. So I'd love to hear about your process on that. Now, if you're a dragonfly person, what do you do to keep the color in your dragonfly's thorax and, thorax and abdomen? Do you have a process that you use? Thirteen twenty two Brendan Burn. Come on. So we have this little scarab beetle here. Um, he does have a little pronotal horn, so if I put turn him on his side like that, you can see there's this little horn on the side. Um, and that's right up here on its pronotum, that shield that guards its back. A lot of times when we are talking about where to put a pin on a beetle, I'm going to go ahead and get my little red dot. We want it to go right about here. So we want it through the right um we want it through the right elytra um just a kind of almost 
just off to the right of center is our goal. Um, any insect that we are not spreading the wings of, we're going to want the pin to go off right. And generally, when it comes out down, when it comes out the bottom of the body, where you're looking on the bottom side, you want it to come out in between the second and the third pairs of legs. So, let's see how accurate we can do. Our specimen is still pretty, um, our, sp our specimen is still pretty flexible, so I'm pretty happy with that. We're going to be able to move the legs all over the place. Um, I will a lot of times go and kind of put my fingers on either side of the specimen like this just to make sure that I'm holding him flat and even for when the pin goes through. I'm going to tuck his leg just a little bit. Alright, so now his legs are all tucked, and I'm going in, and I'm going to be putting that pin right there on the right-hand side. I'm going to flip it over, and look at that. We've got that pin right in there between the second and the third pairs of legs, so I'm happy with that. We are... Are we... Are we... We are, we are mostly straight. I think that we might be tilted a little bit up towards the head. I think the head might be a little higher than the abdomen. But I'm okay with that. Yeah. You're a beautiful little scarab. All right. So a lot of times I will flip the specimen over and kind of work the legs a little bit so that I can kind of put them where I want them. Um, when I am pinning for my scientific collection, I will, I will tuck everything, right? So I go in and I make sure that the legs are nicely tucked and the wings are nicely tucked so that when I'm looking at them through my collection, that I don't have one beetle that's taking up a lot more room than everybody else. And, um, if they're tucked, they are less likely to get damaged, Right, so they've got their legs nicely tucked next to their body. They're not splayed out everywhere and um, uh, bumping other specimens. Because sometimes just having one specimen spinning in a collection can damage multiple specimens, um, depending on how big it is and what it is. He did really good. Aw, thank you! Oh, that makes me happy. You are defending your thesis on Friday. What was your project on? So, I've heard chaos that um, some people have had luck with um, killing their dragonflies in acetone because acetone pulls the body fat out of the insects fast enough that the color doesn't fade as much. I don't know if that makes a lot of sense, but um, I was told once by somebody I trust that um, acetone will help you save some of the dragonfly coloration. Um, I, it also makes them very, very fragile, very fragile. So you have to only do it when you know you're like, yeah. So let's see. You were investigating environmental factors impacting West Nile in Florida. Oh man. Environmental and microbial factors. So you got pretty deep. I'm on the dark side. <laughs> yeah, so with medical entomology, I will admit, like, I am not as strong when we, when people start talking about disease. Um, 
just because it wasn't medical entomology wasn't something I had like spent a lot of time thinking about but I love aquatic entomology and so when you get into um and when you get into like aquatic microbes and aquat and like investigating envi um, aquatic environments I think that all of that is super duper interesting um I pulled when I was blacklighting there were so many June beetles I was like you know what I don't have a June beetle from this location and there are so many um so many species in this genus uh I forget off the top of my head what it is um but there are so many species in this genus that I don't even know if I'll ever be able to identify it to species um but they're fun to collect and there were so many I don't feel too bad about them all right so I'm gonna go ahead so thank you for um saying that you loved my content I super appreciate it I am curious about um I'm curious about yes I love aquatic sampling actually my next couple of whiteboard videos are all going to be about aquatic entomology I um I have the first one whiteboarded and I've got the first three of them um they're scripted but I'm still working on recording and editing do you have favorite content like um, you said you enjoyed my content I'm curious if you are talking about kind of my live streams when I'm sketching or if you're talking about like the whiteboard videos I always like to hear from people I know chaos is a fan of the live streams I see um, I see them enough hanging out All right, we spin the specimen to make sure it's even in all directions. It looks like it is. I push them all the way up so that there's a good space up there. And when I go to the bottom of my specimen, I'm just working some of these joints to make sure that they're going to go where I want them to go. Wow, his tarsi are so incredibly long. Oh my goodness. You got some long tarsi. All right, so we're going to go ahead and put it right here next to our other scarab. And we're going to see if we can tame some legs. Most of the whiteboard videos. Very cool. Oh, that makes me happy. I I have loved creating content since I since I started. And I, um, I definitely feel like I, I want to create more whiteboard videos. Um, I have uh, just, you know... You get a little bit busy when the bugs start flying and all you want to do is be outside, you know? Oh, good! Oh, that makes me happy. So, how did you find my channel? Um, was it, uh, was it, um, a video that was required to watch for class or did you just find me searching on YouTube? All the entomology classes in grad school. Yeah, so my undergraduate was an entomology degree from Michigan State. So I was able to take all of the entomology classes in the undergraduate program. And then once I got done with the undergraduate classes at MSU, they actually allow you to take graduate level classes for undergraduate credit as long as you get permission from the teachers. So I ended up taking adult taxonomy and immature taxonomy and there was one more graduate level class that I was able that I was able to take um, and I just loved them all. So 
So my goal right now is to see about taming these tarsi. I want to get them down. They're kind of pointing up towards the camera. So you put two pins that have heavy angles down to make sure that you're kind of pulling those um, tarsal segments down. And then I will go ahead and kind of curl these a little bit. You're going to laugh at me. But um, I'm going to curl these toes in. Because for me, it's better for the specimen to have its, um, to have kind of a whole shape than to have some segments that are kind of sticking out. I hate when the tarsi break off. That's all. No toes on the, no, no toes left behind. All right, and then I think the front legs look pretty even. Maybe the left one can come in just a little bit. Oh, look at that. That's awesome. Very cool. All right, so we've got our June beetle taken care of. What is next? I have... One more of this species right here. I was hoping that, so these are super shiny and they look like small ox beetles. They look like little ox beetles. And I thought that that was cute. Um, I'm not sure what they are yet, but I will be identifying them shortly. They're so shiny and they were coming into the light I couldn't help it. I picked up two of them. He's still got dirt in his claw. There we go. So I pre, um, before I put him on the board, I go ahead and I flip him over and I wiggle his legs and make sure all those joints are working properly. I go ahead and kind of tuck some of the legs like this. And then we're going to flip them over and put a pin through it. <laughs> oh, good. That makes... I honestly, I love to hear from, from subscribers and people who enjoy my content because I just, just love all of the buggy people and the insects in general. And I feel like, but, oh no, I touched the tarsi. Darn it. I feel like we have such a welcoming, you know, group of people. Like the bug lovers, you know? There we go. I'm gonna hold. Oh, you're. I don't know. I don't know if these are dung beetles. Molecular entomology course. Ooh, that. That sounds. That sounds like it was probably pretty difficult, huh? Molecular entomology. I um. I really wanted to take insect physio in my undergraduate, but the teacher who taught the insect physio um, wouldn't give me permission to sit in on the class. So I never got insect physiology, um, which is actually one of the things that I've always found fascinating about insects, like how they work. I think that is pretty cool. They're little, they're little creatures, you know. They've got, in theory, if you count the foregut, the midgut, and the hindgut, they've got three stomachs, right? They've got an aorta vein. They have a nervous system. They have some sort of group of ganglion that you can kind of call a brain. You know, they're fascinating creatures, and they're so tiny. They have all of these things kind of working together um, to make them work. And they've existed on the planet for millions of years. Like, uh, humanity is not going to be on this planet for millions of years.
All right, I'm just making sure that these legs stay nice and tucked. I'm actually, oh no, I'm actually pretty happy with how its legs came in. So, happy me. All right, the next little friend here, this is a Passimachus. I'm not sure which species because there's two possible species in the region. There's the one that looks more metallic blue and there's the other one that looks more metallic purple. Um, and honestly, this one looked more purple, but there was so much variation in the species that um, I'm going to have to look for a key with better characteristics. But that's what it looks like. Um, the metallic purple, if I turn the light on, maybe, let's see. There we go. Now you can see it. So it has that border edge of a metallic purple coloration. And that is one of the reasons why it just catches your interest. It's this absolutely beautiful ground beetle. Um, it is a predator, right? So it's going to be going out and eating other insects. And you can see it's, it's a formidable size. You know, it's not a small beetle. Uh, we can tell it's a ground beetle because if we look at the underside, ground beetles have expanded coxal plates. So if you look right about, let me get my arrow, right about here, it looks like there's that little bulge right about there and right about there. Those are the characteristics that tell you that this is a carabid. This is a ground beetle. Um, and then for the rest of it, th to know that it's a Passimachus or a warrior beetle, a lot of times um, that is based on body shape, really, for me. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and put it right next to this guy up here. Um, I need to get a pin through it. And like we talked about, the center of gravity for a lot of these insects to make sure that they stay even on the pin is between the second and third pairs of legs. Um, if you're looking at our beetle, we've got the head, the pronotum, and then the elytra. You want to go on the right elytra? I do have pasalids. Let's see. Beetles can be fun to pin. Oh, you spread its wings. So, yeah, I think that beetles can be absolutely beautiful when you spread their wings. And there's probably, I probably should get at least one or two um, spread so that I can sketch them for some live streams. But I, I just love having more space in my collection. Um, so it's hard for me to, it's hard for me to, um, like decide that, all right, I'm going to be spreading these beetles and it's going to be okay that they're going to take up three times the amount of space that they should. <laughs> wow, you ended up having the highest grade in the class. That is impressive. ecologist and then physiologist. That makes sense. I mean, with um, with medical entomology, you have to be concerned with both human physiology and insect physiology. So there's that huge crossover that happens. Um, and you need to know kind of the both and how, how both bodies work so that you can know how they interact. And that is a lot of knowledge. So I have two best beetles as pets right now. They are upstairs and they are the best. They travel with me as and I do when I do educational programs and kids hold them and we allow them to, you know, squeak so that the kids can hear that. All right, so when we do our spin test on this beetle, we'll notice that the pronotum in the head is going to drag a little bit, and that's just because they're that's just because they're it's soft right now. But once my pin, once it gets situated in the right angle, and 
um, he dries out, that whole section isn't going to be as loose anymore. Oh, and on the, um, and on the topic of pet bugs, or I guess pet invertebrates, I have two tarantulas, um, a scorpion, I have best beetles, I actually have a colony of this Passimachus species, um, I killed this one first and then I found four more and realized that I wanted to feed them and watch them eat wax worms and see if I could get them to lay eggs. So I have four more of these Passimachus and I actually collected one mating pair so I know that I have a mated female. Um, I also have a colony of Calasoma sycophanta, um, and I think I have an image saved here that I can show you really quick. So I have a colony of these guys. Um, this is Calasoma sycophanta. I only have about six or seven of them, but I'm hoping um, to get them to lay eggs. I have a paper on how to rear them. Um, and I have a giant water bug that I actually collected at this same location. It came into my black light, and it's a Lithoceros, Lithoceros americanus, the American giant water bug. And, of course, because it's a Lithoceros, it's ginormous. And, um, I set it up with a tank. I don't have pictures of that right now. Um, but I set it up with a tank that has soil and water and it has the ability to fly or it has the ability to come out of the water and kind of fly around a little bit and it is a very happy lithoceros um it has also killed three fish my my giant water bug i was surprised when it killed every fish on the first day because i've had um pet lithoceros before and they would sometimes, you know, leave the goldfish in the bowl and let it swim around with it for a while before it ate it. But nope, my Lithoceros, this new one, just wants to eat every fish, even if he's not going to eat them. He has to bite them and kill them. He was angry. So um, we'll see if he lets a fish live with him or not. I'm hoping that I'm hoping that he'll get past his anger and allow me to have a fish and the Lithoceros in the tank. That's my hopes. <clears throat> and I have an ant colony. Chaos, that reminds me. Let's see. Yeah, traveling with a tarantula and all of your belongings is a little bit difficult. When I moved to Philadelphia, I actually traveled with... Um, I traveled with a leopard gecko, two guinea pigs, and six or seven slings, so baby tarantulas, and that was, that was quite a trip. I'm going to leave the tarsal segments on this beetle um, with an X on the back, I think. I thought about making, I thought about rounding them out like I did with the June beetle, but the tarsal segments on this guy are not as flexible, and they don't seem to want to do that. And I don't think I want to force them. So, we're just going to leave it alone. Now, I do want to make sure that the head and the pronotum doesn't um, slack a little bit, so I'm going to go ahead and put two pins kind of underneath the head and kind of force it up a little bit up towards the camera. That's just going to make sure that it doesn't droop when um, I take it off the pin. And then I'm going to do something with these antenna. Maybe I'm just going to leave them. Maybe I'll do that. I'll round out the antenna in the front. That'll be fine. Oh, 
no! Have you ever been bit by a lithoceros? I have never been bit by a lithoceros, but by the way that you said you wanted to amputate my, your foot, I'm guessing that you were bit by a lithoceros. Did you step on it? Why? How did you get, did, I mean, they are called toe biters. Did you really step on a lithoceros? I didn't know that people actually did that. I was bit by a Nicorid once, which is a crawling water bug, and it's only like, I don't know, a half an inch long or something like that, and it hurt so bad, and I was in front of like seven little children, so there were no choice words that came out of my mouth, but I was very proud of myself for that, for that because I was in significant pain. Check out this caddisfly! All right, so we're not in the beetles anymore. This is a trichopteran. Whenever I'm seeing caddisflies coming into my black light, a lot of times I'll take one or two of each of the species just because I love aquatic insects. I just, um, yeah, they're just my thing. Uh, so I will pretty much collect all of the caddisflies and stoneflies, at least one or two of every species, just so that I have a, a wide variety for my collection. Um, yep, yep, yep. You know there are some insects that you'll keep all the time, and then there are some that you're like, I'll take a picture of that, and you can live another day. Um, let's see. You let the house centipedes go roam free. That's so funny. <laughs> I used to have, when I was living, um, when I was living in Michigan, I had a... Um, all right, let me talk about this, my caddisfly first before I get into that story. Um, my caddisfly. There are two ways that you can put a pin through this guy. Um, the first is you want to put a pin through the very, very center of the thorax, and that is what you would do if you were spreading it, right? So if you were, oops, if you were taking our caddisfly and you were spreading its wings to show it off, you would put the pin through the center. Because we are not going to be spreading and showing off our caddisfly's wings, we're going to be keeping them nice and tucked and controlled. Um, you can make sure that you put it in the thorax, but instead of putting it centrally, you do put it off to the right, um, even though we're not putting them through elytra. And that's because sometimes, excuse me, some insects will have um, characteristics on the medial line. They'll, they'll have characteristics on the very center of their body. And if you've put a pin through it, you have now destroyed any characteristics that are in the center. Um, but if you put a pin off to the right, any of the characteristics that you would destroy are also symmetrically on the left. Right? And so that's why with any of our insects, except the ones that we are spreading, we try and make sure it's at least a little bit off center to the right. Oh, come on. Don't get your legs in the way. There we go. Uh, oh, I was doing it behind my head. Sorry, guys. All right, so I've got my pin taken care of. I'll do the little, make sure that it's going to stay even on the pin. Looks good. A caddisfly that isn't an ethanol. All right, you got me. It wasn't, uh, well, you're right. I didn't even kill it in ethanol. I like my adult insects pinned. You can tease me about it. Um, that's fair. Uh, a lot of times, I'll keep my aquatic nymphs, my anything. Oh, no. All right, she's good. I was just making sure she was even. All right, so, yes, I think that a lot of the aquatics are supposed to stay in alcohol, but I like my insects on pins so that they're easier for me to sketch and to share with people. Um, so, yes. Yep, 
a caddis fly that's on a pin. Any of my aquatic specimens, any of the nymphs, those will stay in alcohol. But, you know... Get all these legs tucked a little bit better. My front leg stays even. And then to worry about the antenna. So these antenna have many, many, many segments. And so when I'm working with antenna with lots of segments like that, I'm gonna make sure that I kind of use multiple pins. Um, and then you'll see that there will be kind of angles forming. And your goal is to keep as many of those kind of um, stronger angles. We want them kind of smooth. Yeah. All right, I'm happy with that. During trying to move my leaf cutter. Chaos, you have a leaf cutter ant colony? Are you in the United States? You thought that it was the same as with mayflies and stoneflies, that adults should be preserved in ethanol. Minute pins and pointing specimens. I got to tell you, I spent way too much of my time um, pointing specimens. I don't enjoy that anymore. Um, I will be pointing some specimens. Um, maybe not today, but it's definitely going to happen. Um, it's not my favorite thing to do. Not at all. All right, so I think we are trying to find some more specimens from that same night so that I can keep it all together. I know I have another vial or two. I know where they are. So this is my collecting pack. Um, I actually use a Cabela's, um, I use a Cabela's fly fishing pack. Oh, check this out. I found this, um, I found this, uh, pupa on the ground at our campsite, and it was the same place that I found those two very large carpenter worm moths that I started by pinning. Um, and I think... I think that's a carpenter worm moth pupa. That is, that is my guess. 613, 2022. 613? Yep. Yeah. Alright, so this is our, my next vial of buggies. So, I'll admit, it's, it's probably, it's probably better if you do, um, uh, give me a minute, I'm looking for a thing. Doop -de doop -de doo There it is. More specimens. A dog bane beetle. Oh, see, these are aquatic and spider specimens that will be staying in alcohol. I was looking for I was looking for a little bowl that I could pour my specimen into so that I can start pulling specimens out. Aha. Let's see. You're in India! Yes, so that makes a little bit more sense that you have leaf cutter bees. I was like, here in the United States, um, you have to have a containment facility to own leaf cutter bees. Thousands, 
kinds of insects. Do you point them all for yourself, or did you, or were you pointing them for a museum? For like a, the university collection. Me, myself, and I collected this biting fly because it bit me. I was like, nope, you're dead. And funny story, this is a pleasing fungus beetle. It has this really pretty orange striping on its back, right? I believe I know the species. If, I believe I could find the species really quickly if I looked it up. Um, but that pleasing fungus beetle, I found it crawling on my back in my house after I went camping. So I went camping and then the next day after a shower and having existed in my house all day I found a pleasing fungus beetle crawling on my back. Oh come on camera. Focus back. There we go. What was the most interesting specimen that you've pinned? So it sounds like you've done a lot of pinning and a lot of pointing. Um, I've seen some really interesting specimens. Um, back when I was working at MSU, I um, had a friend who was working in... We're going to do the pleasing fungus beetle first. Oops. If I get rid of irritability, it'll fit better. All right. So with my friend here, he's got this kind of rounded ventral, so he's going to spin a lot. So I'll take my two fingers and I kind of make it even. And I make sure he's laying flat so that when I put this pin through... His body stays mostly even. It looks like he might be... No, he's fine. Sometimes I feel like they are leaning a little bit forward, but I think that it's just his head that's kind of tilted down a little bit. Honestly, you can't get much more tucked than that. So this next specimen, I'm going, oh, I'm going ahead and kind of loosening the joints a little bit because I think that before I put it into alcohol, it was our, it was passed before I put it into alcohol, so it was already drying a little bit. Um, I was hoping, yes, that this would work. So sometimes it's hard to get these beetles to get their legs to point forward. There we go. Okay. Now I believe this friend here is a dung beetle. And if I look at the underside of this dung beetle, it is a metallic purple blue coloration. See you, Chaos. It was nice chatting. It was lovely chatting with you, too. I look forward to seeing you again soon, hopefully. Ooh, Java. Have fun. All right. Bye, everybody. Looks like everybody left. Maybe we'll have a whole new round of people come through. 
Um, I have lots of bugs yet to pin, so it might be a long night for me, but hey, maybe people will drop by and say hi. Um, hi Nancy, welcome. Oof, that was a close one. I almost thought that I put that pin through the leg. This is an absolutely beautiful beetle, and I am really excited to show it off once it's dry. I poked myself. That's better, though. I feel like at least once, if not twice, during live streams where I am pinning, I always tend to poke myself. What we're looking at right now is a dung beetle. This dung beetle is metallic blue, metallic purple on its ventral, so on its underside. Um, from the top, it looks kind of black and boring, but I promise you, it's impressive when you turn it upside down. Going there to document an endangered language? That is fascinating. Is it what endangers the language? Is it the fact that the population that speaks the language is like not teaching their children? that same language or are there people unfortunately like are they being prosecuted for their language but you have to go so I guess you don't really have time to answer now this next one is a biting fly um, I'm honestly not sure what type yet. Um, I will admit that flies are not my number one. They are not my um, top insects that I know how to identify. Although, if I had a, to take a guess, I would say that it's a deer fly or related to deer flies. Come on, bud. It has these beautiful pictured wings. It has kind of an orange body, and it has crazy mouth parts that it used to bite me. Now, I do think, yep, this is the fly that bit me, because I remember saying, ow, hitting it and dropping it in the alcohol. So I decided, you know, you bite me, I pin you. It's a fair trade. But it also is bouncing around this board like a crazy thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my forceps because it's kind of a smaller specimen. It's harder to hold on to myself. But what I can do is I can go ahead and take these forceps and hold the sides and then make sure that my pin is going to go through just off to the right of the thorax, trying not to make it central. And don't destroy that scutellum, Trisha. Silly. So I have this fly on the pin. 
it was spinning around too much, so I just decided to do it um, while I was holding it. It was just a little bit easier to do it that way. So I'm going to make sure that our legs are all kind of out, streamlined with the body. Hey, this leg wants to stick out like a crazy leg, and I want it to stay in just a little bit. And then I'm going to be pulling these wings back. Maybe. So if I make sure that these wings stay flat in this direction, then I have the ability to see the wings. And the body from both sides. So I'm just making sure that those wings are being taken care of. I'm sorry that the the features aren't as easy to see when I'm doing it this way. He's a little bit smaller than the insects we've looked at previously, but he's still worth pinning. All right, I'm gonna go in and grab some more. I did pull an oriental, this is what we call an oriental beetle. From the number of oriental beetles that I saw and its name, I'm gonna guess that it's invasive. Oh, this is fun. This is a species of longhorn beetle that has kind of shorter antenna. And I have some little leaf beetles. Oh no! There he is. We got him! I dropped a click beetle. All right, so it looks like the next couple of insects that we're going to pin are the oriental beetle, a longhorn beetle, and a click beetle. Um, I also have a flatwood beetle, a little ichneumonid wasp that's black and yellow. It's absolutely gorgeous. Another little ichneumonid, and then this little this little scarab, we might as well pull him out. We'll do the little scarab too while we're at it. So we've got a couple more insects to pin from my black light at this, at Brendan T. Byrne. Wow. Feel free, Chaos, to hang out here and um, and lurk and chat. Um, obviously, make it make make that flight. Sounds like you're going to be doing really great work with your um, with your professor. So it may not be a lot of fun, but I would also say, t um, you know, don't take that type of travel and that type of ability to interact with the public and to make a difference lightly. You know. All right, so because I have oriental, written bo oriental Beetle written on the board, I think that's the one we should do first. That's this little friend right here. Now, my Oriental Beetle, I was hoping. So a lot of these specimens, right when they come out of alcohol, are kind of dark. And then over the course of time, they lighten up, and then you can see their true colors. Um, the oriental beetle, there we go, is this light, has patches of light and dark brown, there we go, 
um, and can be a little bit metallic on the pronotum. So that's a couple of characteristics for this little friend here. Um, they do like to feed on all types of leaves. They're polyphagous, meaning they're going to eat on lots and lots of different types of plant material, not just one type. They eat pretty much everything. And the leaves at the forest that I was in were completely eaten up either by the June beetles or by these Oriental beetles, you looked up into the forest and it was like every leaf was speckled with um, beetle chewing damage. And so I found that kind of interesting. Especially at nighttime, because you would like look up into the woods and you'd put your flashlight up there and you could see all of the... Um, when the light was pouring through the leaves, it was more obvious how many of the leaves had holes in them. So I'm just making sure that it's all nice and tucked and its legs are all in place. Next one is this longhorn beetle. He looks like this. And my longhorn beetle here is one of those longhorn beetles that actually has shorter antenna, and but it has these legs. Let's see. It has these legs that uh, have, that are kind of like, I don't know, they're bulbous, I guess, is how I want to describe them. Let's see. You see how they kind of, they, they narrow and then they get wider? They almost sometimes look like crickets or grasshoppers because it looks like their, um, their femur is kind of expanded for jumping, even though they're not. They don't jump. They just run. They do run pretty quickly. They don't jump. All right, before I get this pin through him, I'm going to play with these legs a little bit, so give me a moment. Um, I like to make sure before the pin goes through that none of the legs are connected to each other. That can be a problem sometimes. So if your legs, if all these tarsal segments are kind of grabbing onto one another and then you put a pin through, sometimes you can break a leg because they'll hold on to the other legs and then you can push on the wrong one and kablooey, you've lost a leg. So I just like to make sure that at least they're not holding on to each other. There we go. That's much better. Okay. Because that's a tall mess of legs right there. And I'm going to be turning this specimen so that it is legs down. And that means that I'm going to need to use my forceps because he's got lots of legs. So we are, I'm going ahead and I'm taking that pin and I'm putting it through the right elytra. making sure that it um, passes the spin test, right? So the insect looks the same at every single angle. And then we push it all the way up the pin so that you just have enough room to kind of grab the pin. And then we go ahead and put them down and we're gonna work on those legs because those legs can't stay the way they are. They need to get spread or tucked or protected in some way. Um, the way that they are right now, they are in danger of getting knocked off by the labels, right? If the legs are all kind of smushed down to um, away from the pin, yes, it looks um, good from the top, but the insect is this much deeper because the legs are all dangling down there. So my goal is to get the legs up off of that styrofoam. There we go.
Yeah, my goal is to grab the legs and to open them up. And then once I get all these legs up away from the pin, away from the body, I'm going to be able to take the insect and actually push it closer to the styrofoam. And that's what we want. We want to be able to... Um, we want to be able to make the legs kind of on the same um, on the same platform, I guess, as the body. Grabbing that leg on the other side of this camera is not the easiest thing in the world. There we go. Now I'm looking for one more leg. And it's really in there. Come on, friend. There we go. All right, so that is one, two, three, four, five, six. He looks kind of wonky right now, right? So his legs are going all over the place. What I, <clears throat> but at least they are out from underneath the pin, right? That's our goal. And so now I'm able to go ahead and push that longhorn beetle closer to the styrofoam, and the legs are still all out. And now I can go ahead and pull some of these, and I'm going to go ahead, straighten that body really quick. And we are going to be able to work on the legs and the antenna. So I'm going to pull the antenna up here for now just to kind of get them out of the way. And we're going to start focusing in on getting these legs all situated. Now we want to make sure that the... We're, we're trying to get them tucked, but we're also trying to make them look a little bit natural, right? So... Um, making sure that the legs don't go in a, a weird direction is important. Um, making, getting these legs, here we go, like that. See, so the legs are it's still in that walking position, right? But um, we also have... So the legs are still in that walking position, but they're also protected because they're close to the body. So we got those hind legs taken care of. I want to make sure this beetle is having a hard time bending right here between the femur and the tibia. Come on, bud. There we go. Almost. All right, so what I'm going to do for this one, because he's having a hard time bending, I'm going to push up the femur like this, and I'm going to pull down the tibia like this, and that's going to allow me to use the leverage of the first pin to make sure that my middle leg stays where I want it to go. And we're going to have to do that with this second middle leg too. We're going to use one pin as leverage to hold the femur, and then we're going to bend the tibia to where we want it to go, make sure those little tarsal segments are pointing in the correct direction, and then pull this pin so that it stays looking kind of nice and even. And then we're going to be grabbing this front leg and we want the front leg to go forward. I'm going to move these pins that I have up here for the antenna. All right, so I've got that first leg up here, and I want to make sure that I'm trying to make those legs very even. So my first pair of legs are both going to have to kind of match. And then I'm pulling this antenna kind of a little bit past the leg. You know, I'm closing and I'm being happy with that. Arrival. I don't know if I've seen the movie Arrival. Amy Adams does in the movie. All right. So maybe I'll have to go and check that out. No, come back. Oh, I messed it up. We're going to have to do that again. I wanted to tuck it just a little bit more, and it decided that it didn't want to. All right. I'm pretty happy 
happy with that, I think. So that's my longhorn beetle. It took me a little bit longer to get all of those legs situated, right? With longhorn beetles, they're going to have longer legs and longer antennas, so they're going to have pieces that move a little bit more. Whereas, like, these scarab beetles, they were super easy to get their legs all situated in the right place because they were already kind of sitting where they belonged. Um... This guy is my next little friend here. It is a click beetle. Um, it's going to be in the family Elateridae. For those of you who um, love your Latin. <clears throat> and I'm not going to worry too much about the legs on this click beetle. So really what we're worrying about is how and where the pin is going through its body. We're going off to the right elytra, aiming between the second and third pairs of legs, and poking through, and hoping that I didn't hit the center. That was close. All right. That was close, but I didn't hit the center. I did stay in the right elytra. So... I'm actually going to drop this specimen way up here in between these two guys because he's not going to need a lot of work. And so he can just kind of sit there and not take up as much space. Um, I do want to go and put one pin right here to make sure its antenna stay tucked because that antenna looked like it was starting to come up a little bit. All right. One more of these, one more of these kind of plain friends, and then we're going to go and we're going to do uh, my ichneumonid. So I do have a little ichneumon. I believe it's in the genus Craddy ichneumon. Um, and it's this beautiful black and yellow striped ichneumon that came to my sheet. It is a little bit smaller, I will admit that. So my, um, so my ichneumon, it's not a giant ichneumon, right? Um, but it was large enough to catch my interest, and it's large enough to not, not point. We're not going to be spending any time pointing today. Um, if you do know what pointing is, maybe one day I will, um... There are definitely specimens that I have that need to be pointed. <laughs> They're just not my favorite. All right, so let's go check out this. Um, we're going to go grab the Cradiac. I believe that's how you spell it. So this little friend here is a little black and yellow wasp, and it is an ichneumon wasp, and it has black and yellow striping not only on the legs, but also on the antenna. Let's see if this works for a picture. I want to see if I can get it focused. So it's absolutely beautiful. There we go. So it has this absolutely beautiful body that's all black and yellow and striped. Um, I actually have a photo of this specimen on Instagram before it ended up in alcohol. Back when it was alive and living on my sheet. Um, I do want a smaller pin for this specimen. Because it is a it, it is a pretty small specimen, so a size two pin is going to be kind of huge. This one feels about right. Awesome. So our little our little ichneumonid friend here is going to end up point is going to end up pinned i know that i think we probably could point this guy because he has such a small thorax um but i want to see about putting a pin through him so sometimes it's just a little bit easier for me to get the pin through in my hands rather than under the microscope or under the camera um 
I also generally will hold the pin in my mouth while I'm working on it. So give me two moments while I get this pin through this wasp. It's nice and small. Come on, friend. There we go. Sammy, you're not allowed up here. Sammy, get away from my pin specimens, baby. My kitty was trying to come up and see me, and she um she's over here begging for food, you know, as cats do. And what she'll do is she'll sit next to my chair, and she'll meow until I stand up. And then once I stand up, she'll run towards the food, like, follow me! Come here. Come here. All right, so she's going to make a, she's going to make an appearance on, um, on the live stream. Say hi, Sammy! Hi. I know. So, this is my beautiful kitty, Sammy, and she is begging for food. She's not begging anymore. You can't send a message in chat? So I am going to work on pulling some of these legs out. Um, my goal is just to make sure that the legs aren't wrapped around each other. Because if the legs are all wrapped around each other, it's going to be hard to tell them apart for identification purposes. Sometimes I'll leave them alone. But this is such a beautiful wasp that I want its legs to be positioned properly. Its front legs are really short in comparison to its hind legs that are incredibly long. Oh, hi, Jody! Welcome! We are pinning bugs today and hanging out and chatting. This Ichneumon wasp is going to be so much fun to sketch for illustration as long as I make sure that these legs... Oh, there we go. Oh, there's going to be so awesome. So this little wasp, it doesn't look like much right now, but I promise when I get it underneath the microscope and you see it during our live sketch-alongs, you're going to be blown away. The colorations and the textures and the shapes on this wasp are beautiful. I'm a fan. So I'm making sure that I have pins where I think that some of the body parts are going to move. So I made sure that I had a pin right where it's going to support where my body angle. This leg right here is driving me up a wall because it doesn't want to, oh, there we go. It doesn't want to come out from underneath the body. We win. Look at us. All right. So we've got that middle leg taken care of on the left side. We've got the middle leg taken care of on the right side. Ichneumonids are parasitoids, although I'm not sure what 
this one specifically attacks. Generally, they are species specific. So some ichneumonids are, um, they make galls, whereas other ichneumons are parasitoids of eggs and caterpillars and other insects. So while, um, so the other thing that we pinned today were these beautiful moths before I grab some more specimens out. We pinned this guy, this, these two ladies right here, these are carpenter worm moths. And we got to spread this, which is a large um, yellow underwing moth. Um, the front wings are, they help camouflage the moth and look like wood. And the hind wings help flash and scare away predators with bright colors. All right. Where did I just put my vial of bugs? I put them somewhere. There they are. All right, so I have a couple of smaller insects that I need to pin um, with this group before I move to another specimen jar. And the next specimen jar, I'm gonna make sure that we've got some really big stuff to look at because these last couple of things are gonna be kind of small. I have a flat beetle, another ichneumonid, and a leaf beetle that we're gonna be pinning. But I think, let's see, we can probably go this jar next and this one has a variety of different species of carabids, so of ground beetles, and a really interesting species of ant that has these stripes on the abdomen. You're supposed to point ants though, so I might not do the ant just yet. And there's this vial of insects from Penny Pack. There's a grasshopper in here. You guys know that. You guys know that I love grasshoppers. I think that they are beautiful. Now, a lot of my, um, a lot of the moth species that I see while I'm blacklighting, I do not, um, a lot of times when I'm looking at moths on a blacklight, I don't collect all of them. A lot of times I mostly, I'm mostly f taking pictures and then I'll collect the larger moths because I know that the larger ones are a little bit easier to spread and they're also more fun for people to look at. So when I'm collecting, I'm not only collecting for scientific purposes, but I'm also collecting for education, right? So I'm trying to collect um, a high variety of species. I'm trying to collect a high variety of species that are ideally also pretty large so that um, people can go ahead and know what they're looking at. You know, I think that when we have insects that are nice and huge, nice and large, we end up with a lot more, um, a lot more interest at least. Uh, let me go ahead and finish up these little dudes. I've got this little leaf beetle to take care of and then a little ichneumonid and then we'll go to some, th some stuff that's a little bit bigger. It's just that the small stuff is important too. So this is a little leaf beetle. It's got two spots on its pronotum and then it has stripes and striations on its elytra. <clears throat> I was looking for dogbane beetles today and a species of leaf beetle that attacks willow and I found neither of them. I went out looking and 
and the dog bane plants still don't have a single chew mark in them and neither do the willow trees the willow branches so um when i was going out looking for when i'm out looking for these beetles a lot of times i'm looking for leaves that have holes in them right i'm looking for um proof that they exist in the area because if i know that there if there are um dogbane beetles in the area the dogbane plants are going to have holes in them um just like i saw i saw tortoise beetle grubs today all right so this is the last little wasp friend here, um, she does have a nice long ovipositor, so we know that it's female. Uh, I do believe that this is also another species of ichneumon or a parasitoid wasp. Now, um, ichneumons are actually the largest family out of all of the hymenopterans. So out of all bees, wasps, and ants, there are more species of ichneumon than any other family. All right, let me do it with my fingers. It's just harder to do on styrofoam than it is to hold a specimen between your fingers, making sure they're even, and then poke the pin through. There we go. And then once the insect is on the pin, if I feel like it's kind of too leggy and I'm afraid of hurting the specimen, I'll go ahead and I'll take my forceps and you can use your forceps to force the insect up the, up the pin. And that way you're just using that force, that pressure to push the insect rather than your fingers, where your fingers can gr accidentally grab a leg and break it. Now, those legs are too small. I'm not going to worry about setting any of those legs. I am going to worry about getting this one antenna just a little bit down to match the other antenna. And that's all I'm going to do for that specimen. It's beautiful. It's done. So we've got a good number of insects done from Brendan T. Byrne. And I'm thinking... I'm thinking that we do this, this bob. Um, this vial. So this vial is from a local park. We call it Penny Pack Park. I went there and I blacklighted one night, a couple nights actually, and so I did bring in some caddisflies because they're aquatic. I did pick up a good number of um, ground beetles in this vial, and also I have an ant and a species of firefly. All right, let's see what we got. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this piece of paper out that has the locality information on it. Let's see. There we go. Looks like May 22nd, Penny Pack, Blacklight. So I'm gonna just go ahead and stick a pin in that and call it great. A lot of times I'll rewrite them, but right now I'm feeling like that'll be fine. That's fine for now. Yeah, that'll be all right. All right, so our first crabid, let's do this one. All right, so when we're talking and looking at crabids, a lot of these beetles are going to be, well, many, many species are going to be dark and have these orange red legs, but the defining characteristic for carabid beetles is actually on the ventral. So if we look down here on the bottom side of my beetle and we look right about here and right about here, it looks like the coxae are kind of expanded and they look kind of bulbous down here. That 
is the defining characteristic for all ground beetles. Every ground beetle has those kind of large expanded pieces, and normally they expand all the way over the first segment of the abdomen. So that's a defining characteristic for all ground beetles, including this big one up here. Ugh. Dropped the lid off of the table. Including this big guy up here, up here on the top right, that is another species of ground beetle. Um, fairly large for our region. Um, that's going to have those expanded coxae on the underside. All right, so I'm going to grab myself a number two pin. Wow, that dung beetle, now that it has come out of alcohol, is really starting to become more and more metallic. And you can see the orange on my pleasing fungus beetle coming out more too. I'm excited. The colors are coming out. Yay. All right. So I go ahead and flip my little ground beetle over. My goal on my ground beetle is to pin it between the second and third pair so that the pin comes out between the second and third pair of legs on the bottom and you want to make sure that you're going through the right elytra so you put it like this where you can see the top of the body you put your fingers here on either side so that you're holding the body um the insect's body flat the beetle's flat and then your goal is to put it right here through the right side and in between where that second and that third leg are coming out. And then to double check to make sure that your pinning job is good, you spin the pin 180 degrees and make sure that the body stays aligned the whole time. If it's leaning forward or leaning backward or leaning sideways, spinning the pin is going to show you where any of your, where, where you've gone awry, if you've gone awry. You also, the goal is to put it between the second and third pairs of legs. But I will admit every now and again, you will accidentally hit exactly where the leg comes out from underneath the body. If you do enough of these, you're going to end up putting a pin through a leg at some point. <clears throat> and sometimes when you do that, the, uh, the pin will actually take the entire leg off of the bottom of the insect. So you do have to be a little careful about that. But knowing where to place the pin, that's something that that's something that comes over comes over time. Also, knowing um, kind of where the bases of the legs are helps. And so that's actually something that you do learn while we are illustrating, right? We talk about where the legs are coming out and how to tell. This ground beetle, when it's done drying, I believe it's going to be metallic. All right, my goal is to just make sure that all of these legs stay even and that they are tucked. A lot of times I'm going to be using the tarsal spur to help guide the legs. Um, so if, I, if you ever see me kind of grab it from the base of the tibia, I said tarsal spur, tibial spur. If you ever see me kind of grab it from the base of the tibia and move it, um, that's me hooking the pin in between the, um, the first tarsal segment and the tibial spur. That's going to give you a little bit of range of movement, right? So if you really do want to have the ability to kind of stabilize your insect a little bit, knowing where you can put the pin is going to be helpful and how the insect grabs onto things. Alright, so it looks like I'm getting, I got my hind legs mostly taken care of. I think that my, I want my left one to tuck just a little bit more. I want it to match that right leg. So I'm going to pull the tibia in a little bit more. And then my front right leg needs some help. 
because I want it to face forward just about like that. All right, and then I do prefer when my antenna are going back along the body rather than straight forward. So since my right one is already going back, I'm going to attempt to angle this one on the left backwards. And sometimes antenna can be tricky, so you can do them individual segments at a time and then kind of try and work them back. Oh, stay there for me. It doesn't want to stay. It's like trying to control an individual piece of hair with a pin. There we go. All right, so we've got that antenna taken care of. So you can see where you only have one pin that goes through the body of the insect. I have something like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I've got something like 11 pins in that specimen to make sure that it stays in the right body conformation, that it stays in the right, um, with its legs in the right direction and all those things so that my specimen is good when it comes out. Now, when I finally do take those, um, when I do take those, pins out from around its body, it will continue to stay exactly as it is because as my insect dries, its muscles harden and then they don't move ever again essentially because they're nice and dry and hard. And if you try and move them, instead of moving, they just break. Which is why people say to be very, very careful with specimen collections, right? Because you can easily break off a leg or an antenna just by touching it because it is um, dry and delicate. So I am curious, has anyone out there been following my Instagram stories when I'm posting, um, when I am posting pictures? was just making sure that my legs were all going to be movable and flexible on this beetle here. It looks like everything is moving just fine. Um, I especially like to double check the front pair of legs because they tend to be the stiffest and hardest to control if, um, if I haven't forced them to move before. And so we are going right here, right elytra between the second and third pairs of legs. And spin! You're good. Now, if when you spin it, it's not aligned and you need to readjust, you can just take the pin off of out of the bottom of the insect, but you can leave it in the top. Just, um, it kind of reminds me of when, you know, you're getting your blood drawn and the person doesn't hit the vein properly. So they have to take it out, but they don't take it out all the way. And then they push it back in. That's kind of what you can do to insects. You can take the pin off out of the bottom, but make sure that it stays in the top. So you only have one hole in the top. And then you can um, get your... Um, you can make sure that it comes out the bottom at the right angle. Looks like we have a firefly to pin. Fair enough. Um... They're the same and different, so I have been on Facebook. I don't know how to find Facebook stories for my Insectopia page. 
But if you went to the Facebook stories, you would be able to see the same images that are in like my highlights for Instagram. But yes, the same type of mothing pictures are on my main page. That's been fun. I'm kind of all over the place. You ladies know that. So right now what I'm doing is just making sure that these legs are mobile and moving right. There we go. All right, so we've got this beautiful little ground beetle here. Now it looks just kind of black and dull. I wish... Does that work? No. I wish sometimes you could see the, um, the colors that I see, because what you guys are seeing are very much like a black shadow, but I promise the elytra are this metallic blue, and the pronotum in the head are this metallic red color. Red-green, I guess. Woo! They have a hard exoskeleton. Sometimes you can tell the difference in insects when you're putting the pin through how hard their exoskeleton is. Oh no! Look at that. That's exactly what I was just talking about. I managed to put the pin through exactly where the middle leg was and it came off. I might have to glue it back on after it's dried. So these ground beetles tend to be pretty fast. I'm actually pretty happy with the way that those legs set down after I got the middle leg in the right place. Uh, oh, oh, where'd it go? There it is. Let's go grab that leg. So this is the, um, the right middle leg for this beetle. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to place it next to the specimen. And oh, come on, bud. Get off the forceps. I'm going to place it next to the specimen, in theory. Come on, bud. There. And then I'm going to put two pins that are kind of crossing on top of it to hold it here, right here next to the specimen. And then when the specimen is all done drying, I will be able to come back and make sure that I glue that leg back on. It's all right. You guys don't have to be everywhere. I just like to I just like to share what I'm doing with you. So, when I'm posting on like stories, a lot of times those images are just things that I'm seeing over the course of like nature hikes and things. Um, I'll a lot of times tag locations. Uh, today I went down to Lardner and I saw tortoise beetle grubs that have their little poop umbrellas, right? So we talked about that in one of our live streams that the immature tortoise beetle grubs, they will actually use their they'll actually use their poop kind of as an umbrella to defend themselves and they'll wave their poop and their old exoskeletons around. Um, and that keeps birds away. And I've always thought that that was kind of a kind of a nifty story. And I saw some of those today. 
I was able to get some pictures. I saw a comma butterfly and um, let's see, I saw a comma. I saw a really beautiful Katie did that had um, light green all throughout its body, but then it had some white, red, and blue stripes. Um, it was awesome, and it was so the stripes were in a place were in places that it made it look like it was almost a uh, a liquid glare. So me myself and I, we, I'm kind of a I'm a fan of beetles. I, I find that over the course of collecting trips and things like that, I will generally bring home more beetles and grasshoppers than any other insect. Um, and that's not because I'm specifically looking for beetles and grasshoppers, but more that when I'm out collecting and putting things that I'm interested in into a jar, it tends to be mostly beetles. <laughs> It's not on purpose, it's just on accident. But I mean if you wanna get if you wanna get into it, most of the insects on the planet are beetles, right? Because there's so many species. Sorry about the squeaky styrofoam every now and again. Oh, look at that. Those hind legs came together very nicely. They, uh, I like, I like a lot when insect legs, um, go exactly where you want them to go on the first try. I'm a fan. Now, can this middle leg come out from underneath there? We'll see. Uh-oh. Oh, it's not a middle leg. Plot twist, it's the front leg. There we go. All right, so we've got that front leg taken care of. I'm about to tuck these tarsi in so that we have the middle leg. There we go. We have the middle leg taken care of on the left side. Now we just have to take care of this right side and make sure that they stay nice and even. So pulling this front leg up into a more natural pose, but making sure it doesn't go too far away from the body so that everything stays safe. And then tucking and grabbing these middle tarsi, making sure that they're out and then tucked in. There we go. All right, so we've got all those legs taken care of. Um, the only thing that's left is to kind of tuck these antenna. So I'm going to go ahead and grab those this pair of antenna, and I'm going to just put it on the inside of this set of pins right here. That should keep it aligned with the legs. And then I'm going to do the same thing on this side. I'm just going to grab it, and I'm going to put it on the inside of this pin. And then I'm probably going to put it on the inside of that pin. There we go. So that's our little crabid. Do I have any Katie Dids? I do have Katie Dids um, pinned, but I don't have any Katie Did specimens to pin today. My um my specs my my collection is six Cornell drawers. So as you can imagine, I've got a lot of bugs. I'll admit I don't have very many Katie Dids. Um, I definitely want more. I have one of the, I believe I still have one of the really big predatory Katie Dids from out west. The ones that, um... They're predatory, so they actually are going to... Sometimes people find them chewing on dead animals on the side of the road. 
and I was out collecting, I think it was, I'm actually, I don't know, remember what state, but I was out west, and it was raining, and I was walking around outside, and there were bugs outside even in the rain, and I got so excited that I was like, well, I guess I'm collecting in the rain, so I went, and I got wet, and I collected a bunch of stuff, and katydids were one of them, one of those big predaceous katydids, it was sitting on a branch, um, kind of underneath um, a gre some greenery protecting itself from the rain. And I was so excited. I sweeped it up with the net. It was the first big predatory Katie did I ever collected. And I reach into the net to grab it with my hands like you do, right? You hold the hind legs. Except the Katie did turn around and it bit me. And it bit me hard. And there were no children around this time. So I did use explanatives and um, it hurt. And I was surprised, but then it reminded me. I was like, oh, right, yeah. My professor did tell me to watch out for the big predatory katydids. And I even believe he told me to make sure to, to watch out for their bite. But I had totally forgotten in that moment because I was so excited to see one that it didn't matter that they bit. I was going to hold it. Um, but I did not hold another one. I was very careful with the remaining predatory katydids. All right, so I'm getting this one taken care of. The middle and the hind legs look like they're almost there. My front legs definitely need some work. So you can see how my front legs are kind of flailing off to the left and the right. And our goal is just to move them so that they are pointing forward and looking a little bit more natural. You can bend them right here at that femur. That was an example of me grabbing that tibial spine and pulling it over. And with this one, it's going to be a little bit harder because the leg is angled a little differently. That's going to be pretty close. All right, so we've got those front legs taken care of. I just want to make sure that my hind legs stay, oh, there we go, so that they're not connected to each other underneath the body, really. I just want to make sure that those legs are not grabbing each other because you end up with all types of problems when they do that. All right, pull it away from your body, bud. There you go. All right, so that is my carabid. Okay, we're closing in on some small insects. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine more to go. I might end up finishing after I get this vial taken care of um, because... It's getting kind of late over here on my side of the country. Sometimes I feel like when I'm collecting, some of these smaller beetles must have gotten in here on accident. Like, I must have just been collecting other things, and then these little itty bitty insects jump into my alcohol all by themselves. But, you know, I always feel like if it's in my vial, right, then I should pin it and put it in the collection, because even though it's tiny, it could have some really cool characteristics that we're not seeing. So, I like to pin everybody. I got judged a little bit for pinning my caddis flies, but I like to pin adult caddis flies. Just in general, adult insects, I would rather have them on pins than in alcohol, um, just so that I can show them easier to as part of education. It's kind of difficult to show off a caddisfly that is in alcohol 
Or it's also very difficult to keep it under the microscope so that I can sketch it or really interact with the specimen at all when it's in alcohol. And so that's why I like to put as many of my specimens as possible onto pins. Some of these smaller ones, I'm just going to pin really quickly and just move on to the next one. They are, when they get kind of smaller like these ones are, the legs are not as important to keep all even um, for me because the goal, the reason we go ahead and tuck all the legs and make sure they're not taking up a whole bunch of space, well, is for space and for the safety of the specimen because a lot of times these bigger specimens are going into small places where they're going to be sitting very closely to one another and there's a chance that they'll bump into one another. And if one specimen bumps into another dry specimen, they can break each other. Um, so we don't want that to happen. Um, and that's why we make sure that all those legs are tucked. But with things like these guys that are super tiny and little cute, we don't have to worry about them as much because we don't, we don't stack them as closely to each other also. There we go. I believe this little friend here is a little cucumber beetle. He's a little leaf beetle that came to the sheet. And I am short on some of these, um, I am kind of short on some of these more common insects, like these leaf beetles. Actually, in one of the other vials that I have to pin, I have the um, invasive ladybug, right? The multicolored Asian lady beetle. Um, because I realized when I was doing ladybugs one day that I didn't have the invasive species and I was trying to tell the kids about it and I didn't have my own picture or my own specimen to show under the microscope. So I made sure to grab one of those and, um, I've got some more common insects that I didn't have previously. You know, funny enough. I have not yet collected a Japanese beetle for my collection. Um, so that's one insect that's super common. You can find them pretty much everywhere. And I'm still going to be going out and grabbing one for my collection shortly. I actually saw one today. I could have, I could have collected it. Alright, so I've got an ichneumon here. This is an ichneumonid wasp. Um, I have... Oh, look, at that's another little pleasing fungus beetle. It's a lot smaller than the one that I have. And if size is anything to say, I would say that this one's a male and the other one is female. Because the other one's a lot larger. This is that ant I was telling you about. It has this really interesting kind of striping on its abdomen. And I'm going to put this under a microscope really quick just for me. Because um, I'm curious, when I collected it, When I collected it, there were more of these species of ants, but they all looked really small compared to this one. So there was a part of me that wondered if this was a reproductive, if it was like a, a queen before she started laying. Because um, she also has this like very huge thoracic area, but um, I didn't see any wing scars. That's what I was looking at. I was looking for wing scars to see if she had chewed off her own wings. Then we have that caddisfly and another one of these little wood boring beetles. Um, I think he's one of those little beetles that just kind of accidentally fell into my alcohol and is now a specimen in the collection. I think after we get those five taken care of, um, I'm going to be saying goodnight to everybody. Uh, that is 
just because I've been doing this for about two and a half hours now and we are closing it, we're getting to the end of a vial and the end of my, uh, my focus, my capacity for focusing. All right, so I'm gonna grab one of these. Let's grab the pleasing fungus beetle first. Sometimes getting the pin through the specimen is really the tricky part because the specimens can be slippery and the exoskeletons can be very, very thick. They can be very hard. Um, there are species of beetles, like some species of ironclad beetles, that when you try to pin them, their exoskeletons are actually so hard that it's easier to get like a very, very small, like a sixteenth of an inch drill bit and drill through the specimen first and then put the pin through. Kind of like how you would pre-drill a hole for a screw. Um, and that is for insects that have very, very solid exoskeletons. For an insect like this one that I'm pinning right now, this is a, another... This is a species of caddisfly. And the caddisflies have a, more of a soft exoskeleton, so I don't have to worry as much about having a hard time putting the pin through it. All right, three more. This little friend here. This guy is that one that just jumped into my vial and he looks almost like a little itty bitty miniature best beetle so there's a part of me that is curious about what in the hell what what he is there we go and it's with this little itty bitty type of beetle that I'm just going to put him on the pin and leave him there. And he's going to dry like that and it's going to be great. And we're not going to worry about him at all. Um, this next one that I'm looking at, this is an Ichneumon wasp. We can tell Ichneumon wasps from other wasps when we're looking at them under the microscope by looking at their wing venation. On Ichneumon wasps, there is a horse head in the wing venation. You can kind of see that there's the whole neck area and the head area with the snout. Like the whole head of a horse is on the wing of an ichneumon fly. And that's how you tell them apart from other species or other families of wasps. Although um, I would say most of the Ichneumon have that horse head in its wings, but there are some kind of oddball specimens and oddball species that don't have those. So you can say, um, you can say if it has those, then it is an Ichneumon. But if it doesn't have them, in theory it could still be an Ichneumon, but it's more likely to be... Um, a family of wasps called the Braconids. Those look, um, they look like Ichneumonids, but they don't have the horse head. They're also parasitoids. All right, so getting these front legs pointing forward. 
Come on, little wasp friend. There we go. All right, so we've got all of those legs taken care of. The last one is this ant, and I have spent a lot of time thinking about what I'm going to do with that ant. <sighs> do I point it? So here's my dilemma. I'm supposed to point the ant. I don't like pointing. We're not going to point the ant today. We'll point we'll point another time together. When I'm going to plan when I plan on spending all night pointing. So my ant's abdomen is a little bit wonky, so what I want to do is I'm going to use pins to kind of, ooh, ow, poke myself, and to straighten out this um, body just a little bit. I mean, I'm happy with that. <sighs> Alrighty, so ladies and gentlemen, we got through a good number of insects today. It looks like we pinned, um, We pinned 34 insects today, ladies and gentlemen. So, from larger scarabs and passimachus, this tiger, be um, that ground beetle, um, to metallic dung beetles and some smaller scarabs and this really cool longhorn beetle that I'm excited to see off of the, off of the spreading board. And then a good number of ground beetles, a dung beetle, some fireflies, caddisflies, ichneumon wasps, and an ant, right? And then on our other board, we have two carpenter worm moths here and here. And then our third one is an underwing moth. And between having spread all of those and pinning all of our insects, we have been together for almost three hours now, two hours and 45 minutes. Um, so I just want to appreciate and say thank you for everyone who has hung out with me today. Um, it is super, super appreciated. And um, you can feel free to go down into the description box and... Um, you know, check out any of my other links. I have a Facebook and Instagram. You can email me. I've got a website that is theinsectopia.com. So you can find me all over the web for various educational insect content. And um, you can always, as always, find me here on YouTube. It's one of my favorite platforms because I have the ability to educate and reach so many people out there. And it's free, right? So all of you out there can see me and learn a little bit and um, not have to worry about that. Now, it is free, but also I do enjoy and I do need um, tips every now and again to help keep me doing exactly what you see me doing here, right? So I love educating and I love bugs, and the only way that I can continue to do this is when, is when I'm bringing in an income, right? So I super, super appreciate um, any and all of any and all tips that you guys can um, send in my direction for 
um, for any of the information that you learned today, right? So I super duper appreciate it. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week, rest of your day. Um, I will be back live streaming Thursday at 10 p.m. We will be sketching together, and we'll have to see what type of insect we're sketching together. I'm pretty excited. I'm thinking a spider wasp, though. It's been so long since we've done a spider wasp, and I have the perfect specimen that I'm thinking of. So um, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your night, and I will see you around. Stay buggy.